Welcome to a special feature, Coffee with Clarissa Profile, on Minister Ng Chi Meng. As a 4G leader, this is what we know. He made the transition into politics upon his retirement from the SAF in 2015. Ang Chi Meng is Minister in the Prime Minister's Office and the current Secretary General of the National Trades Union Congress. He served as the 8th Chief of Defence Force of the Singapore Armed Forces and held the rank of Lieutenant General. He was the Chief of the Republic of Singapore Air Force. He is currently a Member of Parliament for the Pasir Ris Pongol GRC following the 2015 Singapore general election. He has also served in the ministries of education and transport. That is what we know. But today, Money FM 89.3 has been given the opportunity to delve deeper and get to know the man behind the press release. Join us on this journey of discovery. Welcome to the show, Minister. Uh, good morning. Uh, what can I call you? First and foremost, how do I refer to you? Just Chi Meng. Chi Meng is fine. Yep. Is fine. Yep. We will go with that. All right. Now, the National Trades Union Congress is not an unknown entity to Singaporeans, but uh, perhaps you could give us a broader understanding of what being Secretary General means and what the role actually entails. Well, being the set Jane means essentially representing workers' rights. Mm-hmm at the union level. Right. In our Singapore context, I have an added role of tripartism at the national level. Mm-hmm. Simple ideas, but involves a lot of uh, ground and leg work mm-hmm. on any given day. And also transition into policy uh, work with the government as right. a cabinet minister. Right. So a sec gen, well, sometimes uh, you can think of it as a hamburger being sandwiched in the middle. <laughs> <laughs> Literally. Literally. <laughs> so it isn't unusual for a minister to also be sec gen, right? So what kind of challenges do you face with this dual role? Well, you transit each and every day. Mm-hmm. So a typical day in my life could be visiting the unions in the morning, having heart-to-heart chats to see what are the issues on the ground of a particular industry. Mm-hmm going to a lunch meeting like today with another cabinet minister talking about policies affecting the economy or the workers. And in the afternoon, could be cabinet. Right. And in the evenings, could be back to grassroots. Sure. So, very wide. So, you wear many hats. Yes. And (laughs) you you transit almost after three years, hopefully a little bit more naturally. Mm -hmm. But in the earlier days when we just uh, put off my uniform, and became a politician, mm-hmm. well, it was some getting used to. So was that a difficult transition? I have not thought that much about it. Okay. It was a transition. Uh, I would say that overall is fulfilling and uh, enjoyable. Mm-hmm. Strange that, uh, strange as it may sound. Why? Because in this role, I interact a lot, a lot with people. Right. And I think that is really what drives... Uh, me each and every day to mm-hmm. be a politician. Okay, so what's a good day for you? A uh, good day. What well, today is a good day. Okay. <laughs> You're making me laugh before the interview. I'm uh, having good interactions with workers mm-hmm. and we are making important uh, policy thinking as I told you at lunch meeting with another minister right. about how we can position the Singapore economy in tandem with the workforce. Okay. Charting important things and and having an interview with you this afternoon, that is hopefully going to be fun. Hopefully, hopefully it's going to be fun. I am going to try to ask you some probing questions though, <laughs> and and here's one: disruption is a major worry for our workers, myself included. I am fifty this year, so I am at that point where I'm worried about my future and the rest of my career. How is NTUC handling all these major concerns of the different workers that you represent? Well, it it is a very, very good question and one that I get asked almost every week. It depends really on which industry one may be in. Mm -hmm. But overall, if I were to just address this question generically, well, workers will have to do two very important things. Mm -hmm. One is to shift mindset. Think about the new world with the different advance of technology as enablers. Simply look at, look at technology as a friend. How would you leverage with the education that we have, with the skills that we have now, mm-hmm. 
leverage on the technology to be that much more value creating for whichever industry you may be in. So the mindset shift, taking on technology as a friend. Two, don't just keep it at the intellectual level. Because in my conversations with many, many, many workers, mm -hmm. almost all would agree that we need to do this. Right. But actually taking that first step, making it real for yourself, taking the upskilling course, taking a generic course that just in, inspire you to do more, whatever it may be, mm -hmm. direct relevance or generic causes. Take that first step so that you reduce the gap between your thinking about upskilling and your actions. Mm -hmm. And with each step we take, it becomes easier. And I really hope that the Singaporean worker, friends like you, would meld that into your life as part of a journey of life that we keep learning. This is something not just uh, that I'm we saying have today. We to do it to yeah. stay competitive. Yeah. And we are, uh, well, I'm talking to workers today, but even in the education system, mm -hmm. when I was a former education minister, right. we're instilling this joy of learning, mm -hmm. this, this joy, at, uh, this curiosity in our kids so that they can continue through life, not just mugging for exams like, sure. like, like, like our time. Oh, yes. But really <laughs> learning for the intrinsic value of, of learning of something learning. new. Yeah. And of course, not that uh, formal education is unimportant. Mm -hmm. That still is the foundation. But how do you get the internal intrinsic motivator to learn, to pursue knowledge or skills? I think it's important. And it's a double challenge for generations like ours, mm -hmm. we, we were, which were more in tune with road learning, honestly, sure. right. to now get the mature worker to embark on an exciting journey, adventure of learning new things. You you interact quite a bit with your members, with your constituencies, with with your older yes. members as well, right? Yes. Is it a fear of, of IT? Is it a fear of... I'm not sure it's a fear of learning because though that is a very resilient part of our population. But it's, so why are they so resistant to IT? I think it's a combination of all the things you have said. It, it is not a single dimension. Mm -hmm. If it's a single dimension, it's easier to tackle. Sure. It, it is really a mixture and we, we have different people with different preferences and inhibitions and fears. Mm -hmm. So in my interactions uh, with a key grassroots leader of mine, his name is Koh Jae Ming, he, he works with retirees. Sure. So he would tell me, well, different strokes for different folks, mm -hmm. even of the mm -hmm. same cohort. Right. How do you actually encourage? A favourite story of mine really is about uh, encouraging one of my taxi driver's brothers mm -hmm. to embark on technology. He's traditional. So he looks for the hailing of taxis to earn his kit. Okay. And of course, for, for younger folks like us, us, we would encourage him, why don't you use the app? Right. Well, he says, he's very polite. Well, another time. Another time. <laughs> another time, Minister. You know, very polite. Until a union leader, uh, older man also, stumbled upon this wonderful idea. Mm -hmm. They had a long union meeting. And at the end of it, he asked the driver, hey, why don't we order some food? Right. The older brother said, yeah, let's go and go get some. He says, no, you don't Use need to drive. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and you just go through the app and order delivery or some mm -hmm. form of mm -hmm. delivery mm -hmm. service. And he could do it. And now, with this simple introduction of phone app technology, right. it was an easier... Uh, it's a light bulb moment, isn't yes, it? Yes, you can overcome the obstacle, you can use it, and right. you can now teach him how to use Google Maps, how to use the apps for taxi booking, mm. for grab booking, for whatever, Uber or Gojek. Right. Simple things like this, sometimes, that little nudge mm -hmm. makes the world of difference. No, it gives them a reason. You, yeah. you find, have to find the right reason. Yeah to make them want to try. Absolutely. So a food delivery service, wow, really, I could have zi zi at home? You know? Uh, 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 yeah, okay. Zi zi. Okay, that one. <laughs> <laughs> Still like a minister, education minister, you know? Hokkien. <laughs> you know, my mother grew up in Penang, which meant that her her Hokkien was, was quite gym, right? And she always used to roll her eyes when I said anything in Hokkien. <laughs> So, yes, I shall stick to English <laughs> for the rest of this interview. That's all right. <laughs> now, 
I think that uh, you've made this transition, and it was probably a steep learning curve for you as well. Indeed. Um, what have you learned in the last three years? Well, I think of all the many things <laughs> I underwent in the last three plus years, mm -hmm. the most important lesson in politics is not just about the policy making, but also making policy relevant to the folks on the ground. What right. do I mean? Well, you see, in Singapore, we are a very rational lot of people. Yes. And in policy explanation, we would explain the policy complexities to Singaporeans. Mm -hmm. I think we can do better in simplifying the messages to appeal not only to the head, but also to the hearts of the people. Right. And in that, I think it would be something that would for the 4G leaders to be able to build a relationship with our electorate, our people, so that we can be effective in not just policy design, not just policy implementation, but governizing a social compact mm -hmm. with a new generation of Singaporeans. This new generation of Singaporeans you're talking about is more cynical. Indeed. Is more vocal. Indeed is very, very social media savvy and uh, not afraid to express themselves. So it changes the way a leader in 4G, in the 4G group among you, has to communicate with them. It was a lot easier for our founding fathers. I say you do, you accept. It's good, right? But you can't do that anymore. <laughs> I'm not so sure it was that simple. <laughs> well, eventually, <laughs> eventually, that was the social contract. And I remember this conversation with my parents. Um, they, they pointed out that at some point, because Singapore was being built and there was so much going against us, they had to just believe that Mr. Lee had a vision and they had to believe in it. And in order for him to do his best to make it a reality, they had to allow him the faith and the space to pursue it. And that was the social contract that Singaporeans entered with the government then. But it's different now. So these are different kinds of challenges that you face. How do you think you need to communicate with your younger voters? You're surrounded by younger voters right now. How do you communicate with them? Because that's going to be different from the way you communicate yeah. with someone my age. Yeah. Well, what you mentioned earlier is of great importance. Mm -hmm. But what you mentioned about Mr. Lee Kuan Yew's era, mm -hmm. I feel is incomplete. Okay. <laughs> because we had the benefit of hindsight, mm. he says we do. Mm. I don't think was it is... was quite so straightforward. Well, it's not just an issue of straightforward. Mm. It was actually a process of Mr. Lee earning the trust of the people, sure. of the workers. From the very first day when he represented one of the unions in 1952 that he earned the trust over 10 years, became the Prime Minister and with that trust and relationship, that's where your story continues. Mm. Where he says, because of the results has produced and the reinforcing virtuous cycle built upon itself. Right. And it was a leadership relevant and suitable for the era. Right. Well, with whatever context that we agree or don't agree that what you have said for the younger generation, mm. well, one key of why I say what I said mm -hmm. is that how then do we build a relationship with our young brother handling the camera today? Right. How would he know who this 4G uh, group of leaders are? Mm -hmm. How are they like if we do not have a corresponding relationship like what Mr. Lee built, literally, I think, for 50 years of our existence. Right. Well, Singapore is in a transition. I think uh, with the 4G, 5G, 6G, we will have to pay attention to building that relationship and not just designing the policies. Mm. This, in my view, is that uh, co-tandem thing that I'm talking about, appealing to the intellect sure. and appealing to the heart to form the overall relationship that Singaporeans will put their faith in the 4G leadership to move the country together, keyword being 
together. Together. All right. We what do you are, think? I, th- I agree with you. I absolutely agree with you. And because I have children who are in their early 20s, I find that um, this is a challenge that everyone faces on an everyday situation as parents, as teachers, as as bosses, and what more for you. So, which is why it was a question that was very intriguing for me. We come back with Minister Ng Chi Meng in just a while on Money FM 89.3, where we delve into his philosophies, what makes him tick, and what he does for fun. Stay with us for that. Money FM 89.3.